I mean, and I, we always like to stop and take a moment when you hear something that's so insightful like that. Let's have a plan B. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, even if it's the far, far most reaching thing, it's always having a strategy, a backup plan. You never know. And, and maybe it won't be that exact plan, but it's the fact you're thinking and processing because life does throw you very unexpected curveballs. Yeah. So tell us about the day he woke up and what happened. So day 35, no response. So it's looking. No response, kicking, fighting. Um, my friend Patience is here in the room. I won't single her out, but Patience and her husband Jim, um, who works at, at ABC, uh, were one of the very few people allowed to come in. Um, they had a long-standing relationship with us, and I remember, um, you know, Jim saying to me something about hope. And by day 35, it wasn't looking very hopeful. And um, the next morning, uh, I woke. I was pretty dejected. I had actually, I was a little bit, uh, faith is another whole conversation I could have with you guys, and I don't know how you go through a journey like this without faith, and whatever your religion may be, I just feel like it's so important to have a higher power, a place where you can put your fears and your, your hope and your belief. And I had really spent a month really not talking to God, because I was a little bit pissed off. I really <laughs> thought, like, we're, we're a family who gets this. You know, we went through the hysterectomy. We went through the, you'll never have another child again. And, and we understand that life is precious. Not that anybody should have this happen to their family for a lesson. But on day, on night 35, I finally got down in the gross beige carpet in the um, hotel in Chevy Chase and, and uh, said a prayer and just sort of said, there is nothing more I can do. He's not waking up. He's kicking. He's becoming... Um, violent, which was their, their uh, message to me was, this really isn't good. This means it's kind of a brainstem level thing, and, and he's been biting people and fighting back, and so that's not the way it should be going. And when I woke up and went in the next morning, I would have this little routine of going in early first thing before the rest of his family or anybody else was in there. Uh, he had been awake for hours. He was sitting up in bed. And he, the corpsman, because he had to have somebody by his bed at all times, um, because he, so he wouldn't, you know, roll off and hit his head. The corpsman said he had been speaking Chinese and French, and every now and then he would just sort of sit up in bed and say, Bob Woodruff, ABC News. <laughs> <laughs> Which I would love to have a tape of now. At, at the moment, time, it was sort of horrifying. Um, <laughs> I've learned so many things about the brain, and one of the really interesting facts about the brain is that when you learn a language before the age of six, it gets housed in exactly the same filing cabinet. There's no translation because your neurons are so neuroplastic at that age. But then after the age of six, if you learn Spanish or Chinese or something, it goes in a slightly different filing cabinet in your brain. And you may be just as fluent as the native speaker, but it's making a lightning quick translation back and forth between those areas of your brain. So his brain, obviously, was reaching into the English file, which was gibberish, and so it wasn't really finding anything usable. So it was going into the Chinese file, and then it was reaching into the French file. And I find our, the way that That's our brains, amazing. I mean, 50 years from now, if we can keep funds going to neuroscience, it's going to be fascinating. But it all speaks to the regenerative powers um, and compensatory strategies that our brains have uh, in terms of coming back. So he was awake. Um, he wasn't making a lot of sense. He was missing many words and just filling them in with gibberish, but we were just so grateful to see him up and moving. Did he recognize you? He recognized me. He called all of his brothers Dave, which is his <laughs> oldest brother, and he sort of forgot about the twins. We had big blown-up pictures of the kids for him to see. Um, and there are so many funny stories about that moment in time, the pantomime we would do to figure out what he needed. And uh, But my favorite story a couple days later was he. one of the things they had said to me is he... he may not be able to read. He'll probably have to learn to read again. And so the corpsman had some cheesy, you know, bodice ripping book uh, by the bed, and he picked <laughs> it up. And he looked at it, and he said, I, I can't read. I can't read this. And so we were taking him down to the eye doctor later, and I'm thinking, oh my god, you know, I'm going to have to teach him to speak, and I'm going to have this brilliant man. He's going to have to read again. So we're in the... Uh, in the doctor's appointment and explain to the doctor the problem and the doctor goes here let's put these on for a second he goes oh my god the mouse that ran over the whatever I go, yeah, you're over 45 yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is hysterical so you look back and you think god you know this could have gone either way i mean our conversation oh, yeah. would be entirely different one of my funniest ones and i always think about this because because it's so true even today for me when Bob was home and recovering and, and you're back there and you're talking and 
one of the things you start talking about was rebuilding your lives, you know, financially where you are. And you look to him and go, um, I'm worried about how we're going to pay the mortgage. And he goes, what's a mortgage? And you go, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what yeah. it is. That was always your area. Yeah. 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 So terrifying. how did you begin to rebuild that and kind of figure out to, to get, I mean, because this is months. I mean, this isn't like, okay, you're awake now. Let's go back to work. Yeah. You know, uh, what the minute, I mean, I literally stepped out of my life. It would be like someone tapping you on the shoulder right now, and you really don't get to pack, you don't get to prepare. And I had a sister um, and a f two other friends who really stepped into my life in my house because I was physically not even in my town. I was down here. And fig pieced it together, figured it out. You know, the mail coming in, looking through my files, which were in okay shape, not great calling the banker, just kind of figuring it out. And so for the longest time, they carried us through that part of it. And, and Bob's um, financial brain and that whole side of everything is completely intact. Um, Excellent. That began to, you know, whatever he was saying, what's a mortgage? He actually, I think he did understand it, whether he heard me or not. That's another issue. Now I have to say things two or three times, which I always did. But now he gets to blame it on the brain injury. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I think that gently we sort of took back control, but that was a, a whole other freaky thing to have people stepping into your lives and know absolutely everything about you, the insurance policies you have, how much you make, how much you've saved. I hated that. Hated but you it. know, but God loved those people willing to do it because you can't really get through it. I mean, I, I, I really saw that in my life. I mean, just the people kind of take you by the hand and say, here's where you need to be and here's what you need to do. Um, because you just do kind of shut down for a little bit, yeah. but, but but that's a gap. I mean, because you have to be numb, otherwise you you feel all that raw emotion. Yeah. It's just too much. You're overwhelmed. For those who have questions, we have a little card there, so I encourage you to write down any questions, and we'll have somebody come and pick them up. Does anybody have questions? Because I know that um, I want to make we sure do. we have a chance. What time is it? Five of five of. Okay, so we've got five minutes, so we will switch to questions because I really wanted to to have a chance. I think you'd be one of those people. We could have you back here five times in a row <laughs> and not begin I to stress I definitely have five different speeches we could all talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I do. And I thought I was going to have to read stuff from the book, and I'd forgotten my book. So this morning, I'm frantically, what a relief to sit here and, and listen and to just your lovely questions. Yeah. yeah, well, we you are just such a fascinating person. And you spend every summer, I know for a fact, you go up to a summer home. Yes, um, in the Adirondacks. In the yeah. Adirondacks, mm -hmm. which you take a month. Um, six weeks. Six weeks. Because again, awesome. I have a portable business. So Bob goes back and forth, and it's where I grew up as a kid. It's a little YMCA camp. It's just, if anyone saw the movie Dirty Dancing, it's kind of like that. Oh, that's awesome. Complete with square dancing. Yeah, but I think it's really good you take that break. I mean, for the kids, for you. So what's Bob doing today? And what, do you, what are you doing today? So how, how do your lives kind of intersect right now? Yeah, I'm sure he's going into the office today. I think he's doing Good Morning America this week, stepping in for George, maybe Thursday or something. Um, so you can watch and you can look really closely and go, which words are you going to mess up right now? <laughs> um, he, you know, it's a pretty, it's pretty normal. I still have my moments. I, I was talking to a friend on the way down last night and saying, I think, I, I feel like I have my own, this is another whole topic, but I feel like when you come through something traumatic, you have your own post-traumatic stress disorder. I feel like I will never, I know I'll never look at life the same way. And I don't look at life expecting that a bus is going to hit me every day. It's not like that. It's just, it's so much more fragile. And I do take less for granted, I think. But I also feel like I've got my hands out under everybody. And uh, whereas before in my marriage, I could totally, I guess the best analogy is ballroom dancing. I could let him lead sometimes and I'd lead other times. I'm more fearful to let him lead, even though he's fine but it's my own trauma in my head. It's seeing someone, I think, so incapacitated and, and having everyone tell you it's not going to break your way. And even though you see the miracle, I don't know if you ever 100% quite believe it. I can still hear all those pronouncements in my head. He's not going to do this. He's not going to be able to do that. You know, you always think that that couldn't happen to me, and then it happens, and you can't believe it. I mean, it's because we always, like, read life's book as if somebody else's experience, right. and then there's that, that moment of, and gratitude, yeah. and then stuff does happen to you. And, yeah. um, but you do get through it. And how is he resisting your, you know, always trying to be yeah. capturing you? Yeah, and, and maybe I don't show it to him all the yeah. way. It's more an internal dialogue, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah.